This time last year, the Utah Jazz were an interesting playoff team, potentially close to being contenders, and the Nets were widely considered to be the favorites to win the NBA title. And now, just a year later, both of their teams are in completely different situations than they were the year before, which inspired me to think of some other teams that could potentially find themselves in a similar situation next offseason if things don't go well for them this year. We begin with a very odd one, but stick with me on this. The Golden State Warriors, the team that just now won the title, they could be in some trouble. They could find themselves in a situation where a year from now, they are no longer true contenders for the NBA title with some future concerns for them as well. Now, when you look at the roster as a whole, Golden State is obviously in a really good situation for the next couple of seasons, depending on a couple of factors. As long as Steph and Clay and Draymond and those guys are healthy, Wiggins continues to play well, and they have all the young guys coming, right? So they've got Jordan Poole, they've got Kaminga, they've got Wiseman, and all these different players. But there's a couple of different issues here for the Warriors. One is money in general. They have drafted too well. They have too many good players on their roster to the point where it's going to be near impossible for them to continue to pay all these guys. At some point, someone is going to have to go. When you're already paying Clay and Steph 40 plus, when you've got uh, extensions coming up for guys like Wiggins and Poole, when you've got Draymond making 20 plus, and Draymond is the guy that I mentioned here because he reportedly wants a max contract on his next deal. He wants a max extension, and there's just no scenario in which either Golden State or another team in the league gives Draymond a max. He is still a very a very useful and incredible player, a, a future Hall of Fame player, in my opinion. But offensively, you can't be as much of a zero as Draymond is at times and expect a max contract despite the versatility, the passing, the defense, all the stuff that Draymond provides. And I'm not trying to say that they're going to immediately not become contenders if Draymond leaves or if he doesn't get a max, whatever the case may be. But you've got that. You've got some potential injury stuff with Stephen Clay. You've got no guarantee that any of the young guys become anything either in a trade or in terms of top tier level players. And so if Steph and Clay aren't healthy this year and Draymond's unhappy with his contract and the young guys don't properly develop, we could be looking at a very different outlook on the Golden State Warriors this time next offseason, despite the fact that they just won the title. Next up now is a big one. It is the LA Lakers. I've touched on this before in a different video, but there's some more things to talk about now as it relates to the Lakers. So as of right now, the Lakers are committed to Anthony Davis, Russell Westbrook, and LeBron James for this upcoming season. Whether LeBron is fully committed to the Lakers remains unclear, whether Anthony Davis is committed to the Lakers if LeBron does leave is unclear and whether or not the Lakers are going to actually play Russell Westbrook on their team this year also is unclear. There have been some reports coming out recently about the fact that they would now be willing to include multiple first round picks in a potential Kyrie Irving trade along with Russell Westbrook. But all of this together to me leads to what ends up happening with LeBron. He's extension eligible soon. And if he goes into the year as an upcoming free agent, that provides so much distraction and is just such a circus around this team, a team that really doesn't need any more distractions than they already have. And so if you're looking at a team that is in a similar situation to potentially Brooklyn was this time last year, where they still kind of look like contenders in a Lakers case last year, the Nets surely were contenders. Now you're looking at one of those things where like, if they don't have a good year, maybe Bron Lees, maybe Anthony Davis no longer wants to be there. It can very, very quickly fall apart, especially when you consider that the only reason the Lakers are where they are is because of the free agents that they brought in and LeBron, or I should say the free agent they brought in LeBron. And then obviously the trade for Anthony Davis. Star power is the only only thing that got them where they are. They don't have a backup plan. They don't have young guys on the roster that are exciting. And if so, that starts to fall apart on them, it's going to start to get pretty ugly pretty quickly. Next up now is a bit of a confusing one. It's the Phoenix Suns, a team that I recently ranked very, very highly in the Young Cores video that I did a couple of days ago. And so it's weird to say, oh, well, this team is going to fall apart within a year. And really the case for this is what the Phoenix Suns were before Chris Paul got there. And Chris Paul obviously is getting older. You can't continue to expect this guy to be, you know, an all-NBA caliber player over the next couple of seasons, given his age, given the fact that he's a smaller point guard. And if, if Chris Paul isn't that guy anymore that elevates your team in terms of winning games. What are the Suns really? Like, yes, they have Aiton, they have Booker, they have Bridges, they have Johnson, but before Chris Paul got there, that really didn't mean much for them. Granted, those guys were younger. Booker has developed a ton. Aiton is better. Their wings are better. Their depth is better. Their coaching is better. But it, with the exception of the 8-0 run in the bubble, before Chris Paul got there, the Suns were a 25-win team every single season. And as I said, the roster is a little bit different, but if you lose some of that Chris Paul stuff, maybe someone gets hurt, then suddenly you're looking at a situation where they have eight Aiden there, who they never really wanted to retain in the first place. They just did so because they had to. And you're looking at a situation where like, there's not actually a ton that you love on the Suns roster. Like Devin Booker is obviously going to continue to be really, really good, but is he going to want to stay in Phoenix if they're winning 45 games every year after he gets used to kind of being a contender? This guy is still, you know, 25, 26 years old. So a year from now, we could be looking at a situation where Chris Paul isn't on the roster. DeAndre Ayton wants to trade and or is traded. And then you're looking at whatever you get for Ayton plus Booker plus Johnson plus 
Bridges. And apart from Booker, that doesn't inspire a ton of confidence in me in terms of a team being a true, true contender. And I firmly believe that momentum matters within rebuilds or within kind of the team continuity of your team moving forward. I think it matters that they lost the way that they did in the postseason. I think it matters that there's uncertainty of the ownership situation. I think it matters that DeAndre Ayton doesn't really want to be there and the team doesn't want him there, that that doesn't seem like a good situation. And I think it matters that their most important player is 38 years old or whatever he is and continuing to decline as a smaller guard. And so I could foresee a scenario where this season doesn't go particularly well for Phoenix, they lose in the first round, and next off season, we're wondering, where do they go from here? Next up now, we have one that I think is really, really interesting to talk about, and it's the Chicago Bulls, because for the first 40 games of the year last year, Chicago looked incredible. They answered every question that I had a lot of other people had about them before the season, about their defense, about their depth. How are they going to be able to guard? And they became a really good defensive team a good offensive team, which is what we expected them to be. And DeMar had an MVP caliber first three quarters of the season. And then after about 40, 45 game mark, they were a 500 basketball team and at no point were a threat to really do much in the postseason with the exception of stealing a game from Milwaukee and maybe keeping that series interesting at least a little bit. But you'd think they'd be fine, right? I mean, Patrick Williams, Vucevic, they've got Zach Levine, of course, so they just re-signed to a max. But the Lonzo stuff really, really concerns me. I don't know what's happening there with his injury stuff. I don't know when he's going to return, how healthy he's going to look. That seems like a really concerning situation. And he's a guy that I'm really counting on because when him and Caruso and Io and Levine and DeRozan, when they had all these guards they could throw out there last year, they were really good. And then once that depth started to go away, that's where their defense really started to suffer. And so if you're looking at a situation where it's like DeMar, Levine, and Vucevic and not a whole lot else, that concerns me. Not to mention the fact this is a team that owes picks into the future for both the DeMar and the Vucevic trades. And it's a team that, like, I, I like Io. I think Caruso's helpful. Like I said, Lonzo if he's healthy there's not a lot of like young assets on this roster apart from like Patrick Williams that you can really use to build around Levine moving forward and as good as DeRozan was this past year I know we're used to people doubting DeMar DeRozan but I'm going to continue to be one of those guys here because like that was probably as good as you're going to get for DeMar was what he did last year he was incredible and he's not just going to suddenly become awful but last year was kind of the year for them it feels like to be like a top four team in the east and the health stuff just didn't fall their way and if that continues to be the case we could not only be looking at a situation where Vucevic is a weird fit, maybe DeMar isn't as good, your depth isn't as good, your defense isn't as good, you're like a play-in team this upcoming season, then suddenly DeMar is getting older, you don't have the future draft assets, and all of the years of tanking that it took Chicago to get to this point is worth basically nothing in terms of postseason success. And again, the premise of the whole video being we look at them next offseason and wonder what just happened, like where does Chicago end up going from here? And the last up is a very under-talked about one that I feel like needs to get more attention, and that is the Charlotte Hornets because right now when you look at their roster they've got Gordon Hayward who most people believe is overpaid he's good when he's healthy but he's never healthy Terry Rozier who's fine handful of other relatively interesting young guys and then LaMelo and I'd have to imagine that when LaMelo and his family imagined him in the NBA they didn't imagine him on the Charlotte Hornets let's just put it that way and obviously there are rules to keep LaMelo and other you know young star players in place in their team that drafted them for at least the first six or seven years of their career and no Nobody has managed to circumvent those rules. We thought Zion might be the first. He ended up taking the rookie max, but I feel like if there's a player whose family has shown a willingness to do some things a little bit differently, it is the Ball family. And so if there was a player that would risk a long-term payday in order to get out of Charlotte to get to a market that they would rather play in, I feel like LaMelo is one of those guys and I feel like they're already on the clock. Now, I'm not trying to say that LaMelo is a perfect player. I'm not trying to say that he's even necessarily an all NBA caliber player. He still has plenty of room for growth in a lot of different areas, but he is good enough that every other team in the league given the opportunity would want to try and make some kind of move to get him on their team. And if he begins to become unhappy, I think rightfully so, given the lack of talent that uh, Charlotte has managed to put around him, then we're looking at a situation where everything falls apart for the Hornets because they don't have anything else to point to and say, this is where our franchise is going. It's all LaMelo centric and without anything else there, without a willingness to spend to make it better, without a ton of assets to make it better, this time next year, we could very easily be looking at a LaMelo trade request, unhappiness, rumors, whatever the case may be, all the bad things that can happen when you're a smaller market team like Charlotte is that has a big time young player on it with a big presence like LaMelo that hasn't put anything around them to be successful. Maybe they'll be good this year. Maybe they'll make the playoffs. Maybe that'll be enough. But now with the coaching change, going back to Steve Clifford, uh, just some of the uncertainty around this roster and this team, I would be very, very nervous if I was a Hornets fan about what this team is going to look like next year. 
Now, having said that, this is obviously a very pessimistic view on every single one of these teams, but I think it's important to evaluate teams pessimistically at times, because I'm not sure there were many people that thought that Utah would be rebuilding the way that they are at this time last offseason, nor did many people think that things would have fallen apart as quickly as they have in Brooklyn the way that they have this offseason. So sometimes, even if it's not the most fun thing in the world, pessimism is necessary, and I think that's the case for the teams we talked about in today's video.